Sylvester, who uh, did the cover photo. He didn't know it was going to be the cover photo when he did it, uh, but he was gracious enough to uh, allow us to use that photo and several other of his photographs uh, without charge so that we can put, produce uh, the, the illustrated history of Lexington. Uh, it was about a two-year effort, about 18 months that was spent in researching and double-checking and, and doing some original follow-through research on questions that I had had about Lexington's history uh, when I read various other uh, histories, and then came up to, the, uh, to looking for what turned out to be about a hundred different images uh, to illustrate the history. The primary topic I'm going to talk about tonight is the effect of the railroads on Lexington uh, as they came in and uh, came out. Uh, it had a very dramatic effect, but along the way I've got a couple of diversions that I'm going to do. The first one is to announce, uh, if you will, a, a major fact. The only image that Lexington historians have had of uh, Benjamin Gretz, of Gretz Park fame, was an old photograph. It, it's not well preserved. He is an old man. He's gotten to the point where his clothes are too big. We found, through the efforts of Ernie Stamper, who's working on a biography of Gratz, this uh, Thomas Sully portrait. It's oil on wood panel, and it is in the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia. They were a wealthy book collectors and relatives of the Gratz family. This was painted in, in 1831 and had been in private hands until 1970, which is one of the reasons we didn't have it in our collection of, of historic images uh, here in Lexington. Again, I, I don't want to thank the Rosenbach, who again provided us the image without charging their usual fee. Uh, as I say, it's by Thomas Sully, and if you don't happen to be among those who follow art, Sully is the famous portraiturist who also did Washington Crossing the Delaware. So that's who we're talking about as the painter. Um, the Grants family were Swiss. They came to Philadelphia immediately, started making a huge fortune, became very wealthy, began investing in the West, uh, had a saltpeter mine here, had lots of interest between here and the Ohio River at Louisville. And in um, 1819, Benjamin and his wife were sent by the family to Lexington to look after their interest here in the West. Uh, and so that's why he came here, but he stayed here. Uh, the, uh, and there's Maria Grant's his wife. Uh, the occasion was is that they were, uh, 10 years or so after they arrived in Lexington, they were back visiting Benjamin's sister in Philadelphia. And Sully was painting Grant's family portraits. He'd just been hired by the family to work through ultimately at least five. Uh, and so while they were there, they decided to have uh, these two done. And an extra one was done of Grant's sister, which they brought back uh, here to Lexington. This <coughs> portrait of Maria uh, had been lost to the world, if you will, uh, until a blogger looking for Grant's family genealogical information posted up, hey, has anybody ever heard what happened to this? And, and the great, great, great granddaughter of Benjamin and Maria was living in Atlanta and it was in her living room. And she contacted the museum and they started saying, well, would you consider? And she thought about it for a while, even though it was very valuable, very important to her family, the prospect of reuniting the two ancestors via their portraits uh, attracted her, and so in just two years ago, donated this portrait back to the Rosenbach uh, Museum. Now, the, the other thing we should know about Benjamin Gratz uh, is that he not only looked after his business interests in Lexington, but he was a, a civic leader, a longtime trustee of Transylvania College. And if you recall the history of Transylvania College, it was originally in the park that is now called Gratz Park. When that building burned, they moved across 3rd Street to build the current campus. The park became overgrown. Uh, Transy really wasn't taking care of it. Son Howard, who inherited the Grads house on North Mill Street, uh, 
did not like what was going on out his front door, as none of us would in the neighborhood. And he arranged to lease the park personally from Transit to be used as the site of Lexington's centennial celebration. And so there was a great fair and picnicking and going on in the park, which was called Centennial Park for a number of years until the, uh, Howard managed to get it uh, permanently entrusted to the city and named for his father. <coughs> now, having disposed of the grass, we're going to go to the forts of Lexington as we work our way towards the railroads. Now, this was in parents' history, uh, and it's obviously a reinterpretation of what the original fort might look like. McConnell and his crew, of course, were staking claims in 1774 and 1775 at what is now McConnell Springs. And they named the future town Lexington, but they didn't actually found Lexington. Uh, that credit goes to Ensign Robert Patterson. The Patterson Law Cabin on Transy's campus was his. Uh, he and 25 men were sent from Fort Erie to establish a, a defensible garrison north of the Kentucky River. If you think about it, if you're in Fort Herod and the Indians get across the river, you've got a problem. So let's build a defensive settlement north of the river and try to contain the Indians north of there. The first was the blockhouse. It was just simply a blockhouse with a, a wall of, of raised logs around it, and that was the beginning. Then as the land was cleared and other cabins were built, the blockhouse became one of these corners. We don't know which. And they just had the expediency of building cabins and then closing the space in between the cabins so that the exterior wall of the cabin was part of the defensive wall. And this Lexington station was finished by uh, 1782. Now, there's been some confusion, and I, I detail this more in, in the history, there's been some confusion about Fort Lexington. This is not Fort Lexington. Like Bryan Station and other defensible residential compounds, were called stations, and this is this is Lexington Station. Um, in a moment, I'll show you Fort Lexington, which was uh, formally built here uh, in 1780. In what may have been an extra legal document, uh, the the people living here drew up articles of agreement, kind of like the Mayflower Compact. They drew up their own rules for governing the community. Uh, then, in, in 17 91, the town was actually planted. This is roughly 7th Street across the top, High Street there. There's where the courthouse will be built. This street here is Main Cross Street, or today Broadway. That is roughly where the Lexington Station was built. It was built more at an angle to the streets. And eventually, upon the building of Fort Lexington there, uh, they dismantled the walls, and Main Street ran through the middle of what used to be Lexington Station. What made this all possible was this is Fort Lexington. As I said, it was built at the corner, of, at the northwest corner of Broadway and High Street, where the Hyatt Hotel is today. And it was, it was intended completely as a defensible military fort. Uh, Colonel John Todd, again from Fort Herod, uh, supervised the construction in the spring of 1781. The, the walls, timber walls were nine feet tall on the outside. On the inside was a five-foot shelf. And that was intended to provide a, a two things. One, it provided a place for the defenders to kneel and shoot over the upper four feet of the walls. But it also provided a large earthen embankment because the rumors were that the British had supplied the Indians with a five-pound brass cannon. And everybody was anticipating that there would be cannon fired at this fort. So it was built uh, with thick walls to defend that. It is described as having a five to six foot moat around it. I doubt that it was ever filled with water. It's more likely that it was just a big ditch. But again, it was an impediment to an attack. The entrance was on the east, so it's, we're not north-south here, we're standing east-west, and it says way to water. That obviously was going down the hill towards Town Branch. But you think about the necessity for this kind of fort. Lexington Station was down in the valley. Any 
anybody that wanted to could get up on the hill at what is now High Street and have a very clear angle of fire over the walls. It would not do you a whole lot of good if there was a serious attack. So by putting this fort up on High Street at Broadway on the approach from Fort Herod, then it would be able to defend anything going towards Fort Herod, defend Fort Lexington. As it happens, it was never used. And in 1787, they tore it down and used the material for other purposes. Now from this fort, we're going to leap ahead to the Civil War to Fort Clay. <laughs> now as, as Deborah told you uh, in the introduction, you'll learn more about these Civil War forts at a later uh, discussion. Fort Clay was built on the Versailles Road up on the ridge above Davies Bottom. Uh, it was built in 1863. It was, they said it was to guard Lexington. Uh, the truth of the matter is it was guarding the railway system that was down in the valley behind it because Lexington was the funnel through which the North ran men and material and supplies to the Union Army in the South. If they lost Lexington, they would lose the point from Cincinnati, from Louisville, and from Huntington to supply the Army. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's another drawing of it. Shows more detail. <clears throat> it also had a ditch. It had 12 artillery batteries, <coughs> two mortars, a magazine building. <coughs> this is a collection of officers' tents right there. And this was uh, used to defend against General John Hunt Morgan's last raid on Lexington in June of 1864. Among the buildings that Morgan's men set ablaze were some railroad buildings near the, the Lunatic Asylum, Eastern States, former campus up on 4th and, and uh, Newtown Pike area. And so you can just imagine the cannons firing from Fort Clay and Versailles Road up towards 4th Street uh, to try to attack Morgan's men. I imagine the cannonballs did as much damage to the railroad bu buildings as, as Morgan's men had done, and Morgan's men reported no casualties from the engagement. So that's, that's Fort Clay, and that's oriented north and south. Here's a, a sketch somebody did. Fort Clay is here, and these are, these are little houses on Versailles Road. One of, these, one of these things you find it and you want to show somebody about it. Here's a greater map of Lexington. There's the town. Over here is Fort Clay. And over here is Fort Crittenden. And again, it's, it's defending from the Winchester Road area and the railroad that runs out that way, but from a, a higher emplacement. Uh, built by military labor, first with Union troops from the forces occupying Lexington and uh, later with some black Union troops from Camp Nelson when the, the other troops were called back into town. It borrowed three artillery pieces from Fort Clay for its armaments. I don't know if there were any engagements or not. One value of this map, though, is that it does show us the railroads, which is it's kind of like Arlo Guthrie in Alice's Restaurant. I'm finally getting around to what I came to talk about. But here, here the railroad comes in from the north, this is Town Branch, the middle fork of the Elkhorn, and the, the railroads run through. The first railroad company was established, the Lexington and Frankfurt Railroad, uh, incorporated in January of 1830. It was intended to run west from Lexington somewhere. And there, the instructions were just to somewhere on the Ohio River. The first uh, train left in August of 1832 from Lower Market House down at uh, Mill and Water and Vine Streets, which had been taken over as the initial passenger depot. A brick station was uh, built in 1835. From this point in 1835 until the end of the story tonight, it is impossible to travel north-south through Lexington without crossing a railroad. Here we see an 1886 map of Lexington. 
Uh, it illustrates again where the railroads are. You see it's a little more built up. It's a closer view of the railroad going through downtown. You see just a little bit of town branch is left exposed, otherwise it's been covered over by this stage. 1907, not only do we have the railroad going through downtown, out Winchester Road in this area, we now have a Beltline, it was called, a Beltway or Beltline Railroad that ran around the north end of town so that you could get on the local train and go to the racetrack. And the, the stories say that on hot summer nights in August, uh, people would get on the trains at night and just ride for the benefit of the breeze traveling along at just a few miles an hour produced to try to cool off. But, and, and not only do we have the Beltline, what we don't show on here, but I'll show next, is that at the east end of the track just before it heads up what today would be Midland Avenue was a roundhouse and a switching yard. Now this is about where Goodwin Square offices, Village Host, the, the curved building at the east end of Vine Street is located. And as you can see there's several tracks here for the and, and, a, and a repair yard and all kinds of outbuildings. In some places on the east end of downtown there were as many as eight tracks crossing the, the valley as you had spurs that went into warehouse buildings or repair buildings uh, or, or other dedicated uses like that. Uh, underneath what is now the Jefferson Street Viaduct uh, was the LMS switching yard. So at each end of downtown we had huge railway emplacements that could move and reverse and, and service uh, the trains that were going through here. This is from the CNO Heritage Society, taken from the Harrison Street Viaduct looking west. Uh, that's the current government building, then the Phoenix Hotel, just to orient you. Uh, those were, that's the roller mill. I've got another picture of that. That was uh, at Broadway, uh, really where Triangle Park is today. This is the original Vine Street. And right at the end, keep your eye on that little building that's that's where the little Mexican restaurant is at Lyman Vine today. There's the roller mill. You're looking at this. Broadway is the space between this big warehouse building and the mills. So right through there <coughs> is Broadway. That's Triangle Park. That's the Hyatt Hotel Convention Center right there. And those are the tracks running right through. This is looking east towards Ashland Park from the Harrison Viaduct. Again, you see several tracks through here, more industrial buildings, more warehouses. That's the original Vine Street right there. There's the passenger depot. These are all mid last century. And if you remember this, that building is still standing. That track is still in the same place, but this is South Broadway, where during General Otto's administration, the South Broadway was dropped underneath the railroad track to avoid this kind of impasse. So here we were with railroad tracks bisecting town. You couldn't go in any direction from the courthouse without crossing railroad tracks or being stopped by railroad tracks unless you went on North Broadway, and there you had the railroad trestle uh, just past Legends Field going over. So what was the solution? We had to do something. More automobiles were coming along. Uh, there needed to be a solution, and the result was the first business bypass in Lexington, the viaduct system. That's looking towards town from the Lexington Cemetery. This, was a, this is a Lee's Town Road viaduct. It was originally called Cemetery Bridge because the only place it went was to the cemeteries. The only reason to cross that bridge was to go through one of the two cemeteries right across the railroad tracks from it. Our first viaduct was in 1907. It crossed from an old alleyway called Ayers Alley 
It's now called the Harrison Street Viaduct, uh, Harrison Viaduct. It is under Martin Luther King extended. That really opened up the south end of Lexington to development. So all of the development along Rose Lane, Aylesford area, uh, was made possible because the railroad tracks were bridged by that viaduct in 1907. Jefferson Street and West Main viaducts, this one occurred uh, in 1913. In 1914, the newspaper reported that 5,000 people a day were using uh, just the Jefferson Street Viaduct. And with the Jefferson Street Viaduct, what we had was the business loop. You could then go Main, Harrison, High Street, Jefferson, and completely avoid whatever train traffic was going on at that time. And so that was our first business loop or business bypass. This is, a, this is a shot from early 1960s. It's, it's tough to tell. It's easier to see what you're looking at uh, in, the, uh, in the book. But there's the courthouse. So that's Main Street running along there. This is, this is the Vine Street area. That's the old market house. Uh, and as you can see, most of this was warehouses. This is High Street down here. Uh, this next slide is on to the east from there. Again, principally just to show what was the impact. Now we're in the 1960s, and a new federal program comes along that is going to make everything change in Lexington, and in many urban. It's urban renewal, if any of you remember that. Massive federal program. The whole intent of urban renewal was to allow communities to clear out slums. And Lexington was going to do the same thing. Davies Bottom. Irish Town, several of these areas, many of them uh, concentrations of black residents were intended to be redeveloped. There was a plan for a, a big cloverleaf interchange that would take up all of Davies Bottom, completely replace it. And in fact, nationally, the, the uh, black leaders complained that it was not really urban renewal, it was Negro removal of what the program was intended to do. Lexington, however, had a better idea. Someone came up with the idea of using the urban renewal money to remove the tracks. Starting in the 1950s, when my father was city attorney, uh, and during Mayor F Fred Fugazi's first term, they started talking about, can we remove the tracks? Uh, the, uh, 1959, the Louisville and Ohio station at Mill and Vine was torn down. 1960, Union Station on Main Street was torn down. By 1970, the CNO station at Vine and Rose was torn down. I mean, it was clear that passenger traffic was on the decline. Uh, Shelby Kincaid became mayor and prompted a study of what it would cost. And, and they got the railroads to pay for the study. Now, surprisingly, the study came back saying it would take $20 million to fix this problem. Way too much uh, for the city budget and the community at that time, and the idea was shelved. 1964, Fred Fugazi is elected to a second term, and he comes back with the idea of can we get rid of the railroads downtown. A new study is done, 1.3 million would be the cost to the city if the urban renewal money could be used to acquire the land. That's what happened. The total price was $5.6 million. Urban Renewal Agency acquired all the land using federal money. The city kicked in about 1.4 million, and Mayor Fugazi there in the scarf, and other officials had their ceremonial removal of the spikes uh, from the railroads. This came from the Fugazi family, is, is where I got this picture. So, uh, let's see, right there is the YMCA building, give you some context of where that is. Now, right, we, we had this bright idea, we're going to take up the railroad tracks, we're going to redevelop downtown, we're all set to go, right? Nope, wrong. We almost screwed it up. The interstates were approaching Lexington from all directions, and the big debate was where they should run. Uh, the feds wanted to run I-64 north of town, where it is in fact today. But the downtown merchants felt like that would divert too much traffic away from Lexington. 
people from the east would just keep going to Louisville to shop. Uh, so they were agitating for the, the interstate to be closer downtown. At the same time, the feds wanted to run 75 down the Maysville limestone Paris Pike Road straight through downtown. And you stop and think about a moment what the impact of either of those things that happened would have been. We actually adopted a downtown plan calling for the expressway to run through downtown. That's what they called it. They really meant 64. Had the two interstates come through, we would literally have been drawn and quartered as a community. Here's one of the official maps. It was adopted by the Planning Commission. This was a community document. Here's the expressway. <clears throat> the courthouse. I've lost the courthouse. Ah, there's, there's the courthouse. So this is Main Street. This is High Street. So what this, this plan would have had, I-64, coming along basically between High and Maxwell. <coughs> it would have cut off the, the university community down here. It would have sliced through South Hill. Second Street was going to become a divided highway, skirting around Sarah School there. Not quite sure what that was about. There's Grass Park. So you would have major traffic that way, major traffic this way. There's a total of eight bridges projected in this plan to bridge and, and one pedestrian walkway there for some reason to bridge over the interstate as it came through Lexington. There's a, a closer up view of the area we now know is Rupp Arena. But Versailles Road is going to be diverted up this way. Here's the expressway down here at the bottom. Well, we, it's easy to figure out why I-75 did not run down limestone. It would have to go through the university at the other end to go somewhere. And you could, the, the feds could not condemn state property. And the university just said, no, you're not going to do this. Fortunately for Lexington, they did not follow their second choice and move I-75 through the state capital of Frankfurt, which sent all of that traffic away from us. They decided to pick Athens. Go figure. I was uh, interviewing former Mayor Foster Pettit, who was the last mayor, as you know, of the city of Lexington, the first mayor of the merged urban county government. And I said to him, this was an adopted plan. This was part of the master plan for downtown. What happened? He looked at me, he said, I stopped it. And that's exactly what happened. He had the majority vote on the city commission at the time. And he told them, frankly, you're not going to get any permissions or any help out of the city. You're going to have to run your interstate somewhere else. And so uh, I-64 was placed up at the north end of town where it is today. Again, here's, here's I'm going to give you a couple of contrasting views as we wind up here. Here's looking east again. There it is today. There's looking west. And there it is today. And just to put the two of them side by side, the only building that is still standing in both pictures is the Mexican restaurant. But that, there it is right there. There it is up in the other building, so that gives you your perspective. This, to me, is one of the most dramatic contrasting views uh, that we have of Lexington's history. So the redevelopment, the urban renewal, the, the building of all of the new office buildings downtown was the biggest uh, private-public joint venture uh, since the building of, of uh, Lexington Station. And just to put in a plug for the old courthouse, the next the renovation of our old courthouse is probably uh, the next big such project. So we'll take questions. That fella is on the front of one of the urns on the old courthouse steps. So, I'll take any questions, and if there are no questions, we can proceed to the important part of the evening, and that's selling copies of the book, all the proceeds of which benefit the History Museum. Okay, well, if there are none, hop. Ah. Hi, I want to ask 
you may have gone over this, but I was late coming. Um, do you think if we would have kept one railroad system just for the trolley sake in downtown Lexington, that that would have changed and increased our urbanism for the city? It might have been interesting to keep uh, the belt. There's a, a belt line system that ran around the core of downtown. Uh, <clears throat> The, the forces at the time were purely automotive. Uh, the, the passenger traffic on trains was dropping down, so there wasn't real incentive for the railroads to do that. The Greyhound Bus Company was on a national campaign to eliminate travel by train so that you would take the bus. Uh, more and more people were buying automobiles, and the basic city planning was build more roads. The railroads were in the way. You have, you have some cities, uh, you have cities like Louisville that built their interstate between the city and the river and cut them off and have regretted it. Uh, cities like Nashville did have a rail line uh, preserved. Right. It, 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 might, it might have been fun, but at the moment, once that federal money came through to remove the tracks. Was was the composition of the railroads here, I mean, obviously they're, they're competing railroads, but uh, from what you're saying, it sounded like they were dominated by passenger traffic as opposed to freight or coal uh, type traffic. Well, you come back and you look at this, I guess really where I want to go is, is the... Uh, Remember, that's crossing Broadway. That, that, that is about where uh, the near building would be where the uh, Radisson Hotel is, Triangle Park is there. Uh, that's not passenger. Yeah. There, there was a, you know, the, furn the Victorian Square was known as the furniture block. You know, the shipments would come in, they would come into these warehouses. The furniture stores coalesced in, in Victorian Square block. And there was a lot of, of industry and shipping that was more than just passengers. Uh, the the uh, Southern Railway Station was on South Broadway, uh, main passenger station there. Uh, the passenger stations downtown were at the east end of downtown, where, of course, more of the folks likely to buy a train ticket to go somewhere uh, would live. Uh, but on the on downtown proper, west part of downtown, were more where warehousing shipping. In fact, there was a separate shipping uh, terminal in, in the west end of downtown. Brad, do you have one? Well, first, I think somebody will thank you for donating the proceeds of the sale of your book to the History Museum. I said, you know, knowing as I do how much time and effort, and it's been a two-year labor love for you to spend on this book and then give away the proceeds. I think it's a remarkably generous thing, and I applaud you for that. But holding on this picture for a second, I don't have any memory of those tall buildings in the background. When, when did they come down? They were all part of urban renewal. Is that right? So that happened in my lifetime? In your lifetime. Mm -hmm. But not, not part of your life. <laughs> Apparently not. <clears throat> now I remember I remember some of the some of the buildings downtown uh, as as we would go. My mother is here tonight and she would take us downtown to shop. I remember driving over the Harrison Viaduct and looking out and seeing the tracks. Uh, there was a there was actually a, a pedway over Old Vine Street that connected two different industrial buildings up about the third story level that I recall. Um, but again, the, the, the viaduct system did its job. Once we got to the Harrison Street Viaduct, got over that, then we were downtown on Main Street where the department stores were and the restaurants were and, and where downtown life was. But my real question is that, you know, we're talking about master plans and railroads. I'm wondering whether there was ever a time when an officially adopted master plan contemplated condemnation of all of the tracks that run south from downtown Lexington <laughs> out, you know, to say Fayette Mall. I, I remember a period of years, if not decades, in which that seemed to be a big issue. We were going to create not an interstate, but something so that they could either look like and allow us to get on down, get get onto a road downtown at a speed of 50 miles an hour, all the way out to the, to the 
Was, was that ever a plan? I'm going to ask my father about that. <clears throat> there was a plan at one time, <clears throat> never an officially adopted plan, but Henry Ward was commissioner of highways, and we were proposing a toll, a toll road system to take up the tracks and have a main road going uh, north and south on that, that end of town with an interchange at the west end and have a 10 cent, to 10 cent toll. But Henry Ward would not <coughs> cooperate and could not get any uh, state funds, so that was the end of it. Any other questions? All right, well, again, thanks to Virginia McClure at the Kentucky Room. Tom Dupree Financial for co-sponsoring this with the History Museum. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it.